John Lennox has asked me to give you the possibility to put questions as soon as possible. He will represent or present himself, and afterwards we uh, give the, the opportunity to you to ask questions. The questions will come in written or orally, so feel free to speak out and put your questions. You can write down the questions and send them up to my good colleague here, Gunnar Isfeld. And we will uh, arrange them a bit and uh, give them to, uh, to, to Lennox. So, uh, our dear friend and uh, professor from Oxford, John Lennox, heartily welcome to meet the youth in the Faroe Islands. Thank Some pupils have asked me, who is this John Lennon? <laughs> and I have told them that it's another John. So we want to ask you, who, who are you? And who were you when you were young in the last century? Yes. Uh -huh. Well... Thank you for your warm welcome. It's lovely to see you. Unfortunately, this is Friday, and I cannot speak Faroese on Friday. <laughs> I only speak it till Thursdays and after Saturday. But thank you for your welcome. Mais I vous parlez français, monsieur. Oui, je parle français. Si on veut parler français, c'est magnifique. C'est magnifique. Et si, si je spreche en Deutsch, si je spreche en Deutsch, auch. Deutsch yeah. And they speak also Russian? Yeah, I speak Russian. Thank you very much. If you had to speak Russian, it would be so nice. But unfortunately, no Faroese. Terrible, isn't it? Yeah. But I'm currently Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. I started many years ago in Northern Ireland and I studied mathematics at Cambridge, and I then went to Cardiff in Wales, where I worked for 25 years. Included in that time, I spent three years in the German-speaking world, which is why I speak German. And then, about 20 years ago, I came to Oxford. And all of my life, I've been interested in languages first, actually. I wanted to study Latin, and then I wanted to be an electrical engineer, because I have spoken many times to the Faroe Islands on the radio, as a radio amateur. And then I decided to do mathematics. So I've kept interest in the humanities and in the sciences all of my life. And I've been interested in where mathematics fits in science and where science fits in the big questions of existence, which we've come to talk about today. I am married to one wife. I have been <laughs> married for 46 years. And I have three children and I have seven grandchildren. No doubt many more to come, but there we are. <coughs> Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what challenges you met in high school and uh, specifically in university when you were young and is there any difference between the challenges we meet as young people today compared with those in your younger days? Well, the challenge I met at school was I wasn't very good at rugby <laughs> and I wasn't fast enough to run on the wing. And I wasn't heavy enough then <laughs> to be a forward, so I was pretty useless. And in cricket, I couldn't see the ball coming, so that was the end of that. And the only thing I could really play was table tennis. So I wasn't very good at sport. Life has probably changed enormously since my day. I come from a very small town, 12,000 people. So I went to a school that's smaller than this school. And I enjoyed school. Some of the teachers were good. Some of the teachers were hopeless. Hopeless and, uh, teachers? Hopeless, yes, uh -oh. I'm afraid so. Okay. But anyway, I recovered from that. <laughs> but 
I had several teachers that really influenced me. The main influence came from the Latin teacher, who was a brilliant linguist and gave me a love for language. And then there was a mathematics teacher who really inspired me with a love of maths. And th that, uh, I look back with great gratitude to those teachers who took an interest in me. I was famous at junior school, primary school, because I was the only student who would ask the teachers for extra homework. I didn't think I got enough. <laughs> Super, remember that. <coughs> the, main <coughs> the main item uh, uh, for this hour will be the relation between science and faith. Could you, by way of introduction, give us a short, perhaps historical, um, line up uh, with this debate from uh, the, the Enlightenment, just to, to, to know where we are now. Well, science and faith in what? I mm. presume you mean faith in God. And the very formulation of that shows me that the idea of faith is very unclear to many people. When I speak about faith, I mean faith in God. I also mean that there is faith in science, and I'll explain that in a moment. You see, looking back historically, I think the main point that has to be made is this. The modern science, as we know it, began in the 16th, 17th century, with people like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so on. They all believed in God. And there's a connection, a very strong connection, that unfortunately today we don't hear much about. C.S. Lewis put it this way, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected to find law in nature. Why? Because they believed in a lawgiver. And many people, particularly um, students today do not realize that belief in God didn't hinder science. It was the motor that drove it. Now that's a very important thing. So as a Christian, you see, I say that I'm not embarrassed, ashamed or anything else to be a Christian and a scientist because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. It was belief in a rational intelligence behind the universe that led to modern science. Now we're in a very strange situation. Isaac Newton believed in God and he did brilliant science. He gave us the law of gravity. Stephen Hawking, who was at Cambridge at the same time as I was, he's a bit older than I am, he believes the law of gravity shows that there's no God. So Newton <laughs> believed in God, gave us the law of gravity. Stephen Hawking thinks that the law of gravity shows that there is no God. Now, if you like, I can make just some introductory yeah. points so yeah. we get the discussion going. So that raises a historical question. How could Newton believe in God and Stephen Hawking doesn't? And I think that there are some very clear reasons for that. And the main one is to do with explanation. When we study science, we come to think that science explains things. Isn't that right? Science explains. But what they did not teach me at school was the limitations of that. For instance, the law of gravity, what does that explain? Well, it does not explain gravity. I wasn't taught that. I thought it did explain gravity. The law of gravitation is a brilliant mathematical formulation that enables us to do wonderful calculations. But Newton realized it doesn't show us what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. And if you don't agree with me, have a read at Richard Feynman the Nobel Prize winner in physics. That's the first point. Secondly, um, <clears throat> science explains in certain ways, but science is not the only way to truth. Let me illustrate that very simply. 
Why is the kettle boiling? Well, because heat energy from a Bunsen burner is conducted through the copper kettle. It reaches the water, it's agitating the molecules of water, they're moving faster and faster, and that's why the kettle's boiling. What would you think if I said, nonsense? It's boiling because I want a cup of coffee. <laughs> now you see, those are two levels of explanation. The one is scientific, the other is personal. I want a cup of coffee. And if I said to you those explanations compete with each other or conflict with each other or contradict each other, you'd say I was being silly. Now, the key to understanding the contemporary debate in my mind is to realize that at the level of the universe, there are the same two levels of explanation. God, as an explanation, does not compete with science because he's a different kind of explanation. Let me illustrate that exactly. A Ford motor car. Suppose we had its engine here, a Ford motor engine, okay? So I say to you, I'm going to offer you two explanations of it. One is automobile engineering and the law of internal combustion. That's the scientific explanation. The other explanation is Henry Ford. Choose. Now I can see that that's just stupid. If you're going to give a complete explanation of the motor car, you need both explanations. You need the scientific explanation and you need the agent explanation, Henry Ford. It's exactly the same with the universe. Science and God, they don't compete, they don't conflict, they're different kinds of explanation. You see, I believe there would not be a universe here for physicists to study if God hadn't created it. Scientists didn't invent the universe, it's there, you see. So the first point to clear up is this. When Newton discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say, oh, I've got a law of gravity, therefore there's no God. That's exactly what Hawking says. No, what did Newton do? He wrote the Principia Mathematica, the most famous book in the history of science. And he wrote in it, I hope that this book will convince thinking people that there is a God. In other words, the more he understood about the universe, the more he admired the genius of the God that did it that way. And you know that's the way it works. The more you know about engineering, the more you can admire a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes Benz engine. The more you know about art, the more you can admire a Rembrandt. And the more I know about the universe, the more I admire the God who did it that way, not the less. So that's my stance. Hawking says, no, we've got the law of gravity, therefore we don't need God. His problem is very simple, I think. He doesn't understand the nature of God. And you say, that's very strange. No, it's not strange at all. When I was young like you, and I used the word God, everybody knew what I was saying. I was talking about the creator God of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's no longer true. And Stephen Hawking thinks that I believe in a God like a Greek God, the God of lightning. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. That kind of a God. We call that kind of a God a God of the gaps. And for that reason, Stephen Hawking tells young people and also older people that you must choose between God and science. That's because he thinks of God as a God of the gaps, as just an explanation, an X. And when a scientific explanation comes for lightning, then the God of lightning disappears. 
But the God of the Bible isn't like that at all. He's not the God of the bits of the universe I don't understand. He's the God of the bits of the universe I do understand. And Newton understood that pretty well. So the reason, I think, to answer your question, sir, is that we've got into a fog because people are confused about the nature of God. You see, let me put it to you this way. If you believe that God is simply a God of the gaps, then you have to choose between God and science because that's the way you've defined God. But you see, the Bible corrects that at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not in the beginning, God created the bits that I don't understand. No, he created everything. So once you see that, it leads you to see that Hawking's concept of God is wrong. And also, I believe, his concept of the levels of explanation in science are wrong. So what I leave you with at this point is the very simple observation <coughs> that God no more competes with science or conflicts than Henry Ford competes with science as an explanation for the motor car. We have got some questions, yeah. and one of them is, why do Dawkins and his friends speak about blind faith? What is blind faith? And is there any blind faith? Well, what they do actually is worse than that. They think that all faith is blind faith. Because Dawkins, and I've interacted with him, and you can see, by the way, if you want to follow this up afterwards, I have a website, John Lennox. Dot org, and you'll find all kinds of things in there, johnlennox.org. You see, faith, now I'll have to use English here, the derivation of the word faith is from Latin, fides, which means trust. And the first question, if I say I have faith that the pharaohs are going to win the World Cup in football, <laughs> I believe that the pharaohs are going to win the World Cup in football. You might ask, what basis have you got for that belief? Once you use the word faith or belief, and it's the same in Greek, uh, the language of the Bible, you have to ask the question, what's the basis of your faith? Or you've got a friend in school, I trust Jane. And somebody says, why do you trust Jane? And you say, well, for this reason, I found her to be loyal, I found her to be, etc. You've got reasons. That's normal faith. I had faith in an aircraft to bring me from London to Copenhagen to the Pharaohs. I trusted it. That's what we normally mean by faith. But you see, what Dawkins has done is to change the meaning. And he thinks that faith is a, a religious word only. And B, it means believing where there is no evidence. Now that is very dangerously wrong because that actually is what we mean by blind faith. And it is dangerous. The Christian faith is not blind. I believe in God because I have reasons to believe in God. Now the very important thing about that is this. By redefining faith as blind faith, the new atheists like Richard Dawkins move attention away from the fact that science is based on faith. Science involves faith. Of course it does. Einstein once made the remark, he said, I cannot imagine a scientist without that faith. Now I didn't mean faith in God. He meant faith that science can be done. Let me put that another way. I'm a scientist. Why do I bother doing science? Well, because I believe it can be done. I have faith that it can be done. Why do I have faith that it can be done? Because I believe this universe is rationally intelligible. That is, it is in part accessible to human reason. I believe that. That's my basic faith. It's the faith of every scientist. You've got to believe that before you start. Now, <laughs> the next interesting thing here is this. 
I work in Oxford, and there are many scientists there. And I sometimes say to them, what do you do science with? Oh, they say, I've got a wonderful piece of equipment that cost a billion pounds or something. And I use, oh no, I said, I don't mean that, I mean this. Oh, you mean my brain. I say, okay, I actually mean your mind, but you think the brain and the mind are the same, that's all right. <laughs> I don't. But you do it with your brain, do you? What's your brain? Tell me about your brain that you do your science with. And give me the short story, because I haven't got much time. You just tell me the short story. What's the short story about the brain? And they say, well, really, the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I say, and you trust it? If you knew your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, you wouldn't trust it for a minute, would you? Of course not. Why do you trust it? Now, here's where the problems start. If you're an atheist, why would you trust the end product of a mindless, unguided process? You've no reason to. That's why I'm not an atheist, ladies and gentlemen. Not because I'm a Christian, but because I'm a scientist. And I believe science can be done. The very interesting thing now is that one of the major arguments, and it's been raised not just by Christians like me, but by atheists, have a look at a book called Mind and Cosmos by the philosopher Thomas Nagel. He's saying this. He's saying we have a big problem. If you get rid of God, then you're reducing thought to physics and chemistry, and that means you're removing all meaning. Now, because I'm a scientist, I believe there is meaning. Believing in God gives me a base for that. Atheism takes that base away. So this business of faith is crucial, but the most interesting part of it is not the faith in God, it's the faith that we need as scientists. What is the ground for it? And I want to suggest, very provocatively of course, that atheism doesn't give me the ground for it. Um, you mentioned a atheism a couple of times. I but did, yes. Yeah, uh, just earlier you uh, mentioned the, the new atheists. Yes. Can you uh, explain that? Oh, yes, yeah? of course. Um, well, there are the atheists, the new atheists, and now we've got the new, new atheists. So it's moving on. Um, the new atheists are a movement mainly led by Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, and the difference is not in arguments, but in militancy. Richard Dawkins said some time ago in the lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I recommend not atheism, but militant atheism. They want to destroy religious belief. And the reason they give for it is 9-11. They say, that's religion, that's unacceptable. And if you say, but hey, just a moment, that's, that's extremist religion. It wasn't the Amish doing that. They say, it doesn't matter, extremist religion grows on the base of moderate religion, so we've got to get rid of religion. And Steven Weinberg was perhaps the Nobel Prize winner in physics. He put it like this, he said, you know, the best thing we scientists can do for this generation is get rid of religion. And anything we can do should be done. That's a bit sinister, actually, to hear. So the new atheism is very militant. And I'm glad you asked me the question, because many of my colleagues in Oxford are atheists, but they're not the new atheists. They actually come, and very quietly they say to me, thank you for taking Richard Dawkins on. I hope you don't think we're like that. I have many, many atheist friends throughout the world who are very respectful, they're not militant, we can have a good public discussion, we can be friends, we can go out and have meals together. And that's the way it ought to be done. So the new, new atheists have reacted against the old, new atheists. And the new, new atheists say, look, religion has some very nice things about it. Let's not knock religion. Just let's 
not do God. Let's leave God out and take the good bits out of religion and we'll all be happy. Well, I'm not very happy with that idea either. But th that's the sort of thing. The reason that I mention people like Richard Dawkins and the new atheists is simply they have enormous power in the media. And they write the books that sell in millions and many people have read things like The God Delusion and so on. But don't let's get the impression that they're the main group of atheists, they're not, but they're the most loud group of atheists. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, there's a question from uh, one of the pupils. Yes. I understand why you say that there must be a God, and then the question, but why the God of Christianity? Yes, that's an excellent question. That shows you've been listening, and that always uh, impresses me. Thank you for that question. You see, what I've said up to this point about science and God, you're quite right, it does not get us to the God of Christianity. So you're very perceptive to ask that. The reason I'm a Christian has to do not just with science. You see, Christianity itself tells you that you can only learn some things about God from creation. St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes to the Christians in Rome. He says, look, God has left evidence in the universe. And he puts it this way. He said, the invisible things of God are seen, are perceived in the things that are made, the creation, the world around us, the stars, and so on. What can we see? We can see, one, that there is a God, and two, that he's powerful. That's all. You cannot deduce the basic doctrines of Christianity from looking through a telescope or a microscope. Of course, you can't. You can come to the conclusion that there is a God. So how do we get to the Christian God? Well, on the basis of evidence. I don't know any other way, but here I want to bring the humanities in. Science isn't the only way to truth. History is one of the most important disciplines and personal experience. And my reason for being a Christian has to do with both of those things. The objective, I mean, I know people will quibble at this, history and personal experience, objective and subjective, it's very difficult to classify them exactly. But let me put it this way. The events concerning Christ, his life, death, and resurrection are outside my own individual experience. They happened a long time ago. So I approach them historically, and I approach them evidentially. You see, the main reason, one of the main reasons I'm a Christian is that I believe that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead, and I believe that as a scientist. I've written about it in my book, Gunning for God. I examine how I, as a scientist, look at the evidence for the resurrection. And on that evidential basis, I make my decision. So the question was put, why the Christian God? There are other monotheistic religions. I'm very aware of that, and I have friends in all of them. Let's take the three main ones, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I have friends in all of those. They will agree with me when I say the following. My Jewish friends believe that Jesus died and did not rise. My Muslim friends believe that Jesus did not die. I believe he died and rose. Those three things cannot all be right, can they? All three are claims about history. And the reason I'm a Christian and not one of the other two, is I believe the evidence points towards the fact that Jesus died and rose. So for me, largely, it's a matter of history, but then secondly, it's a matter of experience. I'll just say that briefly. Um, you see, Christianity is testable. What do I mean by that? I mean that Jesus makes claims that if we trust him, we can experience certain things. Forgiveness real peace, receiving eternal life. We can have a changed life. And I ask myself, well, does that work? And I've seen it work thousands of times. 
So part of the evidence for me that Christianity is true is the effect on people that come to believe. So all of that, now I could elaborate on that in great detail, but I'm just pointing out to you that there have to be reasons for trusting. Otherwise, it's blind faith, and it's very dangerous. Here's another question. Um, if you were grown up in India, would you be a Christian? Uh, put in other words, you are Christian because you are born in Northern Ireland by Christian parents. Mm -hmm. That's why you are Christian. Well, no, and yes. You see, let me explain something to you. The question is very important because it's been the main motivating question that's driven my life. My parents were Christian, my grandparents were Christian, my great-grandparents were Christian. So it's obviously Irish genetics, isn't it? <laughs> well, you need to know something about my parents. First of all, they were Christian without being sectarian, and secondly, which was very unusual, they allowed me to think. They did not make up my mind for me. So when I got to Cambridge, where many other people from Northern Ireland simply forgot God, I didn't, because I had reasons for believing. Now, the question that you just put to me, a student put to me in my first week at Cambridge in 1962, which is a very long time ago. He didn't put it quite like you did. It was a bit more forceful. He said to me, he said, do you believe in God? We just were sitting at dinner in the college. Do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, sorry, you're Irish. <laughs> he said, of course you believe in God. You Irish, you all believe in God and you fight about it. Now, I'd heard that many times before. But I thought, this is very interesting. Here am I in Cambridge, one of the best universities in the world. I've got a real chance to meet people who did not grow up in a Christian home. And so I decided on that day to make friends with someone who'd never been to church, whose parents never went to church, and I spent my whole life befriending people like that. You see, I grew up, and you have grown up, we all have a worldview. We're influenced. Now, you say, if I'd grown up in India, would I, remain, would I have been a Hindu? I might well have been. But whether I remained a Hindu would be another matter altogether. I know Hindus who've become Christian. And what was crucial for me at Cambridge was this. The first person that I befriended who did not share my worldview, we discussed for two years, and he became a Christian. And I've seen that happen thousands of times. In other words, people can change their worldview. They can be interested, not, I've got a good, comfortable background, that's fine. No, but what is true? And the reason I spend so much time debating people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens is because I want an answer to that question. You see, when people say you believe because you're Irish, what they're really saying is, that your belief has no content because I can give a cause for it. But I could say, you disbelieve. Let me tell you a little story. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. On this, uh, Peter Singer, is he a concept for you? He's the world's most famous ethicist. He's a professor at Princeton. And this is what he said to me at our big debate in Melbourne. You can see it online, it was very interesting. He said, of course, he said, my big objection to all this religious stuff is, well, what you just said. You, I told the audience that my parents were Christian and so on. And he said, there you are. People remain in the faith in which they are brought up. So I waited till it was my turn to speak. So I said, Peter, I've told the audience where I'm coming from. I think you should tell the audience where you're coming from. Tell us, were your parents atheists? And he said, yes. So I said, you've remained of the faith in which you were brought up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. And I said, really? I thought you believed it. 
It was amazing and cyberspace went electric at that point because here's the world's leading philosopher and he doesn't see his atheism as a belief system. Now the irony happened after the debate. Peter Singer is a Hungarian Jew and immediately after the debate a very brilliant young man went up to him and said I'm actually a Hungarian Jew too and they had a great conversation until this young man said but I became a Christian. So immediately after the debate he was confronted with someone from his background who had changed their world view. Now, of course, your question is partly hypothetical. I do not know where I would be today if I had been brought up somewhere else. But what I do know is this, that it's possible to change their worldview. Many people brought up in my background are now atheists. They've changed their worldview. And I hope they've reasoned for doing that. So it, it seems to me, yes, our backgrounds are very important. But if you say that's the whole cause of it, Really, you're destroying us as human beings. We have the power to choose and decide, and that's what's valuable about us. Thank you so much for that answer. Here's another question from the pupils. Um, is religion too powerful? And do you think that we are able to eliminate religion as was tried in the last centuries by uh, some world views. And what would be uh, the influence? Well, is religion too The background is that we have now a huge influence from religion, uh, Islam, ISIS and, that uh, and ISIS thing, yes. and so on. And we are afraid here in Europe. Yeah, of course we are. But reason. we will, I do not put the question to, to, uh, to look down upon Muslims no. as general, but can religion be overtuned? Well, clearly it can. And remember, the new atheism came from extremist Islam. Uh, it was a reaction to that. Now, we need to be careful here, as you say that when we introduce other religions into the debate, I want to be very clear that I believe that all men and women, whatever they believe, whether they believe in God or don't, they're all of infinite value because they're made in the image of God. That's my view, that everybody's valuable. So we must be very careful how we treat them. That's point number one. Point number two is this. It's perfectly clear. Leave Christianity out that some religions, aspects of them feel that the only way to get forward is by violence. Now, other religions here must speak for themselves. You're quite right. But as a Christian coming from Northern Ireland, you've heard about Northern Ireland, haven't you? And you see, my own family has suffered religious violence. My brother was nearly killed. My father's business was bombed, even though he employed people from both sides of the divide. So we know all about that. Now, the important thing to say, there are two things I want to say here. Firstly, people often ask me about this aspect of religion, uh, Christianity, this violence in Ireland that people have died from. And I know it's complex, there are sociological features and so on, but let it just stand. People in the world have the impression that what happened in my country has to do with Christianity. That's enough for the moment. What do I think of that? I'm ashamed of it, utterly. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been linked with a gun or a bomb. But the reason for that is very simple. People who take up guns and bombs in the name of Christ are not following Christ, they're disobeying him because he explicitly told people that his kingdom was not of this world. And that's why his followers don't fight. So, from the Christian point of view, it's very important to realize that Christ told his followers that violence was not on the agenda, and that for a very simple reason. The one thing you cannot impose by force is truth, especially if it's truth about forgiveness and peace with God. 
So as a Christian, I find it extremely important to go back to the New Testament to see what the stance was of Christians vis-a-vis -vis violence. That's the first point. The second point is this. If you get rid of God, you don't get rid of violence. There's no excuse for what happened in Northern Ireland. There's no excuse for what happened in the Spanish Inquisition. There's no excuse for what happened to the Crusades. All fought in the name of God. But get rid of God and go back to the 20th century. The amount of blood that has flowed from atheist regimes is almost immeasurable. You mentioned in a joke John Lennon, and John Lennon had a song, Imagine. Do you remember that song? Imagine a world without religion and all this kind of thing. Well, I'm not John Lennon. I'm John Lennox, as you know, but I've written a song. It's called Imagine. <laughs> imagine a world, I'm not going to sing it, of course, but imagine a world without Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot. What about that world? Now, here is where I get very worried about the new atheists like Dawkins. Not a word. Not a word about it. In fact, worse still, Dawkins wrote in one of his books, he's had to take it back really now, I cannot imagine an atheist who would bulldoze a cathedral. And there was a very witty East German who said, Dawkins is right, Cathedrals are much too big to be knocked down by a bulldozer. Stalin and Ulbricht used dynamite. And for someone who's an Oxford professor to say that he can't imagine an atheist bulldozing a cathedral, you just wonder what planet he's on. When I give a lecture on this in the Polish Academy of Sciences, they stopped me in the lecture and they said, send him over to us. You see, over 100 million people died as a result of an atheist ideology. Now, I spent a lot of time in Russia. I speak the language. I'm very interested in what atheism does to people. And again and again, my Russian friends say to me this. We thought, we thought, that we could get rid of God and keep a value for human beings. And we discovered that we could not. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a great thinker and writer, said the main reason, the short reason, the main reason why we had so many millions of people killed in our country is this. We have forgotten God. So the point I'm making really is this, that you don't solve the violence problem by turning to atheism. Personally, I think that Christ brought into the world a peace that people can experience and they can become little islands of peace and propagate peace. And that's the way we can fight against this. That's one of the ways we can fight against it. Do you think people uh, don't believe in God because it is inconvenient? E.g. Uh, alcohol, sex, and those... those uh, Pleasures, if you might. <laughs> well, um, I, I think that's quite possible. Um, uh, but it's a very confused view that uh, God invented sex, by the way. It's a very good thing. And he's not against it. He wants us to enjoy it so much that he tells us how to do so. If you buy a new car and you come driving down the road, and you've got a little lever here that says drive and reverse. And I wonder what this does. So you're going at 160 kilometers an hour, and you put it into reverse. You wreck the engine. If you'd read the handbook, you would have enjoyed it more, because the handbook, the book that comes with the car, is meant to help you enjoy it. And sex is so powerful that I believe, and I know I'm old and all that kind of thing, but I believe that God has given us a handbook not to decrease the enjoyment, but to increase it. Not everybody that plays endlessly around with sex is enjoying life, as far as I can see.
So that's just one thing. I think we must be affirmative here that God invented these things. Um, as for alcohol, uh, you will find that too much alcohol destroys your brain. Uh, you might find that a little of it is very enjoyable. The, the, some Christians disagree and so on and so forth. But I noticed Christ at a, a wedding, when the wine ran out, he made sure there was some more. <laughs> so this idea, what's behind the question, of course, is God wants to see if you're having fun and then say, stop it. <laughs> That is, an, is a very false idea of God. That's not the way we come at it. God loves each one of us. And the biggest thing in my mind is, he loves me enough to tell me the truth about life. I may say, no God, that's too extreme, that won't work. And then in bitter experience, I learned that he was actually right. And it's that way I come at. Now, inconvenience, of course, is a very big question. Um, I was just reading yesterday, um, or the day before, a book that I hadn't read before, an essay, and it was by a leading atheist, I can't remember his name, and he said, I don't believe in God because it's inconvenient. I do not want to change my lifestyle. And I know that if I were to believe in God, I would have to change my lifestyle. Now, I find that very sad, because what he thinks is that he's really free if he gets rid of God. I think it's the opposite way round. That, well, that's the difference, you see, one of the differences my home made never occurred to me growing up that God was boring or dead because my house was open to discussion, no holds were barred, we could discuss everything, it was wonderful. So I think it's just a false idea of God and we need to, we need to correct that. There is a question here from the students too. Why has God given us a free will? when he is almighty and all-knowing? That's an interesting way of putting the question that comes up every time. Why has God given us free will when he is all good and all-knowing? I think what's really behind that is how can there be free will if God knows everything? So this is a very difficult question. Are you ready? Let me just say one or two things. The first error I think we make here is to think that if God knows something, that causes it. That God's sitting here and before time and he knows everything, so he knows what you're going to do, so he causes it. That's probably totally false. Number one, we don't know what time is. Number two, we don't know what God's relationship to time is. What we do know is God's relationship to time is not the same as ours. Jesus once said something very interesting. He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> so God could know everything simply because he sees it. Doesn't cause it. Suppose I'm in a helicopter above the Empire State Building. Okay, you imagine that? I can see two streets, like that. There's a car coming down this street, and I'm right above. I see both of them. Car coming down this street, and a car coming down that street. I know what's going to happen. There's going to be a crash. I don't cause it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the greatest gift you have is your free will. You see, God could have made robots. We make robots, don't we? Would you like to have a robotic girlfriend or a robotic boyfriend? I don't think you would. I wouldn't want a robotic wife. Come home and you see an iPad here, says kiss. So you press K for kiss and you get a mechanical kiss. Be meaningless. You see, the point is this, that God has created us in his own image with the capacity to choose, which means the capacity to love. Robots can't love and they can't hate. They can't have relationships. You can. That's a wonderful gift. So if you're not able to sort out the philosophy of it, we know instinctively that part of our dignity as human beings is that we are morally responsible. A robot isn't morally responsible, and nor is a lion. If the lion eats you, if you stick it, your head into its cage, it won't be in court next week charged with murder. 
because it's not regarded as morally responsible. You are. So this is part of our human dignity, I believe. It's a huge topic and we could spend hours on it, but you don't want me to. <laughs> or maybe we, we do. Okay, <laughs> uh, go well, on, it's up this, to you. This is uh, a bit related. Um, one student's, student asks, what do you think about the arguments of suffering? If God exists, why does he allow suffering? This is the hardest question. It's hard for atheists and it's hard for people like me. And obviously, I would say it's probably the main question. I've just been in America um, doing a series of discussions in major American universities. And the major topic of discussion is this one. So let me say something about it. There are several difficulties. There are two problems. There's suffering and pain that comes from moral evil, what people do to each other. Then there's suffering and pain that come from what we call natural evil, tsunamis, cancers, earthquakes. They're not the same. They can be related. Human greed can lead to deforestation, which can lead to starvation. So that connects the problem of natural evil with the problem of moral evil. Secondly, there are two perspectives. A professor of oncology studies and treats cancer. It's very different being a professor of oncology and being a young woman of 20 who's just been told she has three months to live because she's got cancer. The oncologist sees it, but hasn't got it. The young woman has got it. So there are two different sides. So there's a, a philosophical side, if you like, but there's a pastoral side. And we need to be very sensitive to that. Now, many of my friends don't believe in God because of this question. I'll tell you that straight. I've been in Auschwitz many times. And you don't come out of Auschwitz laughing. I've wept every time I've been there. And I have many friends who lost all their relatives in the death camps. I've met people who were in the Gulag in Russia. And the questions come, why does God allow the suffering? Could he not build a world in which it didn't occur? He could, of course. He could, of course. It does relate, as you say to the previous question, he could build a world of robots. But then there would be no love and there would be no you. Because you are a human being. Now, I have three children, as you heard. I remember when my first child was born, it was about this length. And I held this little girl up and I thought, do you know, you could grow up to reject me. Why have children? Well, aren't you thankful your parents had children? Because you're here? You see, as parents, we take the risk because we're bringing into the world very, very interesting beings who are capable of choice. They're capable of showing a great deal of love, but they're capable of doing a great deal of destruction. What do you think a parent would think if their son goes into a classroom and shoots 20 pupils dead in the United States. That's happened recently, hasn't it? Now, that, that's difficult. It's very difficult. That it seems to me that C.S. Lewis is right on this, that you cannot have human beings with all the dignity that their freedom and love and so on expresses without the risk of evil and suffering. That's number one. Number two, I speak to my friends who say, look, I'm an atheist because of this. So I say to them, I say, I understand that. But have you really solved the problem? You say there's no God. The suffering is there. Have you solved the suffering? No, the suffering's still there. You haven't got rid of the suffering. You got rid of God. So what do you believe the situation is? 
Well, it's just brute fact. That's what it is. Most people in the world suffer a lot. Those of us here are very privileged. Now, if you take the atheist route, you don't get rid of the suffering. You do get rid of all hope by definition. I mean, think about it. If there is no God, there is no ultimate justice. The vast majority of people who've ever lived don't get justice in this life, you know that. And there is no world to come in which they'll get justice, so they never get justice. So the hope of justice becomes an illusion. Now, because I believe in God, I've got a problem with suffering, but I've got hope because I do believe that justice is going to come. When the early Christians appeared in front of the courts and the philosophical discussion groups in the ancient world, they said Jesus is risen from the dead and that shows that he's going to judge the world. Now you see, because I believe in God and because I believe that Christ is risen, I believe he's going to be the judge. And that's a wonderful thing because I do not think our conscience that cries for justice is an illusion. I think God will judge the world. The problem is, what's he going to do with me? And here's my final point. This is a huge thing. I could spend a lot of time on it because it's so important. By the way, if you want to see more of what I think about this, just Google my name and New Zealand. I arrived in Christchurch three days after the earthquake. And I had to meet people who'd lost their husbands, lost their wives. And I talked on television and so on. You can see a lot there. My final point is this. How do I cope with the problem myself? And it's this way. At the heart of Christianity, there is a cross. You know that. And the claim is, and it's good to listen to it, even if you don't agree with it, it's good to hear what Christianity says before you reject it. It claims that Christ was God incarnate. He was God become human. And he ended up on a cross. So the question naturally arises, what is God doing on a cross, to put it crudely? Well, one thing it shows me is this, that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. Christ didn't end at the cross. There's a resurrection as well. And if you put those two together, I can begin to see, and I've seen the effect of this on many, many people, not a solution in the formal sense, but a way in to dealing with it. You see, let me put it finally this way. When we look at the world, we see beauty. The Faroe Islands, if you could see them, are beautiful, obviously. A lot of beauty. But in this world, there's beauty and barbed wire. There's beauty and bombs. That's the way it is. We've got to face that. And you can say what a good God should, might, would, could, etc. do. And you can argue for weeks and weeks and we've all done it. And I've never found anyone in my life who's been satisfied by such an argument. So I think we may be asking the wrong question. The question I ask is this, granted that it's obviously a mixture of beauty and barbed wire, is there any evidence that there's a God whom you can trust with the ultimate solution to it? And I think the answer to that is yes. And it has to do with the cross and the resurrection. So that would be my initial approach to that question. Is there any good moral action that could only be made by a modern Christian that could not be made by an atheist. That's Christopher Hitchens' yeah, challenge. Isn't it? Yeah. I, I yeah. think it's very interesting. Well, uh, an atheist cannot go uh, uh, as a missionary doctor to the center of Africa and, and set up a clinic, uh, as I pointed out to Hitchens. Mm. And he said, you're right. 
Um, he thought I'd answered his challenge to a certain extent because I had the opportunity to talk to him about it. And I said, Christopher, you know, my colleagues at Oxford, many of them are medics, and they say to me, why is it when we go to Africa and go to the most difficult places in the world, it's always you Christians that are running the clinics and, and doing this? But secondly, I think there's a confusion behind the question because I'm not claiming as a Christian that we're the only good people around. That's very important. Let me repeat what I said a few minutes ago. I said every man and woman is made in the image of God, so we're all moral beings. My atheist friends could put me to shame. You read in the Bible, you read many believers in God made such a mess of things that the pagans pointed it out to them. Abraham was one, the father of the faithful. So I, I think it's very important to recognize that if every human being is a moral being made in the image of God, then we are all capable of doing things that are very good. So um, I wasn't very impressed with Christopher's challenge, I'm afraid. I liked him very much and got on with him well, though I disagreed with him utterly and violently. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, uh, which one, Hitchens or Dawkins, do you find more militant? Well, I, uh, we need to be careful when talking about people, you know. I attack ideas, not people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's pretty obvious to most people that, that, that Dawkins was more... Um, is more violent in that sense, is more aggressive than Hitchens, although Hitchens was pretty aggressive. But you know, things like that I, I, I find slightly distasteful uh, because I, I want a public debate where we attack ideas, not people. And so my idea of a debate, if I do a debate, is that I can go and have a meal with a person afterwards and have a discussion and so on and so forth and, uh, and friendliness. So I'm not sure where we get in answering that question. Here's another question. Um, These uh, are very good questions, you know. Yeah. Excellent. Well yeah, done. Good question. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> so one of the students asks, I is there an absolute morality, moral, oh. or isn't everything relative? Everything is relative. Well, Where? clearly not, because the statement, if everything's relative, that statement is relative, so I can ignore it. <laughs> The statement, everything is relative, is an absolute statement. So everything can't be relative, can it? I mean, many people see that now. What we're really talking about is postmodernism, which is dying, by the way. I hope you realize that, that um, even the French have given it up and they, call, they talk about ultramodernism. That's a different story. But this idea that there's no such thing as absolute truth is self-contradictory. The statement, there is no absolute truth, is regarded as an absolute truth. Finish. So we need to go somewhere else. Now, the first part of the question, is there an absolute morality? Well, the interesting thing is this. Most of us believe in many absolutes. We believe in truth. You believe that there was a discussion here at 12 o'clock, didn't you? All of you, you, you came here. <laughs> I have a friend, he's not completely right, he's very bright, but he's not quite right on this, but he's nearly right. He says that most people are only relativist in areas they think are not important. Have you ever met a relativist bank manager? You go into the bank and you say, I'd like um, a million kroner. Is it kroner you yes, have here? Yeah. And uh, I've got two million in the bank. And the bank manager looks up his computer and says, actually, you owe the bank 500,000. Oh, that's only your truth. <laughs> really? Do you think you get anywhere with that? Of course not. In the vast majority of our lives, we believe in absolutes, ladies and gentlemen. We all do. Secondly, in morality, we do too. Have you ever met anybody who's sane, who thinks that torturing babies is right? Of course not. And there's a famous atheist philosopher in Oxford, he's dead now, J.L. Mackey. And he says there is a pathway from our, belief, our intuitive belief in absolute morality and God. 
This is another route. It's not the scientific route. I've written about it in my book, Gunning for God, that one of my reasons for believing in God is the science arguments. But now here's a whole new set of arguments. The fact that we're moral beings and we believe in absolutes. Where does that come from? Now, of course, there are areas of life where there are different views. But generally speaking, if you investigate every single culture, and I've tried to investigate most of them, and C.S. Lewis did it in the 1940s, came up with a very interesting thing. He found in every religion, every philosophy, including atheism, he found the golden rule. Do unto others what you would expect them to do to you. He found it everywhere, even in Roman pagan religion in Britain. He found it. Why is that? Because human beings are moral beings. And I would add to that, as Lewis would, and they're made in the image of God. So it seems to me our recognition of those absolutes is a very important thing. Now, of course, there are many things we're relative about. Do you like that painting on the wall? Some of you would say, well, that's brilliant, isn't it? And others would say, well, I don't see anything in it at all. It's a relative thing. There are many areas of life that are like that, and that makes life interesting. Why do you think that painting's good? And you give your arguments, why do you not think it's good? And so on. But in core things, there tends to be that core of absolute morality. And that, to my mind, is part of the evidence, the fact that everybody's got it. Everybody's interested in truth. That shows, I think, that's another pointer to God. Um, here's another one. Is it um, advantageous to build society upon a certain morality? Um, Christian, um, Islam, Sharia, Catholic, Protestant. Uh, uh, isn't it better to separate religion and politics? and have a secular state, totally well, secular state? That's a very complex question. Most of us live, as I do in Britain, in, well, ours is a, a secular state. We have far few believers in God proportionately than you have in the Pharaohs. I, I think I wouldn't put the question quite that way because it makes it confessional uh, in the sense that Christian, Muslim, etc., etc., etc. What I was saying a few minutes ago is, as far as we can see, there is a common core of moral values. Now, we can start there. Where they come from is a separate question. And the only reason society, in my view, doesn't completely fall apart is because we all deep down believe in those values. Whatever explanation we give for them. Somebody must, may say, I believe in those values because I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew or I'm something else. I believe in them because I'm an atheist and I, I believe in human goodness. But if the values are the same, at least you can bring those into society. That's very important. The difficulty is, I'm good at sorting out the difficulties, not giving the solutions. But the difficulty is, that there's another side to this, and that's what's getting people very worried, and it's that values are worldview dependent to a certain extent. Let me give you an example. Now, it's not a topic I want to go into because that would skew the whole thing. But let's take the case of a human fetus now, I happen to know one of the world's leading experts on gynecology. And we had a discussion once. And this person said to me, look, what's your problem? It's just a clump of cells. We can do what we like with it. And I say, of course we can, from your perspective. You're an atheist, you simply believe that material is all there is, so this is a clump of cells. But I said, now think about it for my situation. That's life. It's not any kind of life. It's not plant life. It's human life. And from where I sit, it's made in the image of God. So what right have you to interfere with it? 
In other words, her ethical position and my ethical position differ because of our worldview. And the thing is, you see, that we have lived in Europe several generations now of students who've been taught that human beings are only one species among many. Well, if you teach people that eventually, they'll start to behave like animals. So there's a connection between ethics and worldview. And many politicians I talk to, they don't know what to do about this because they realize, you see, that what is being taught is not neutral ethically. There's a connection between atheism and certain types of behavior. And there's a connection between belief in God and certain types of behavior. And what do politicians do? I'm just glad I'm not one. But I think it's very important for us to be aware of the fact that there is a connection. Now that's a huge topic. It's a topic for a day's debate and, and that's all I can really say sensibly about it now. What about the, the Bible as the word of God? Yes. Um, do you think uh, that's uh, the way to believe in the Bible? That it's uh, the word of God from beginning to the end? Well, that's, I believe the Bible is the word of God, but I don't expect other people to start there. Of course not. Why do I believe it's the word of God? Because it makes coherent sense. And having studied it all my life, the more sense it makes. So I've come to my conviction, not by saying, right, it's the word of God and you accept everything, but by actually testing it. And I don't know what's behind your question. You might want to elaborate and give one or two examples or, 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 or what's really behind this. Do you mean in, in how does it link with science or, um, or something like this? <laughs> no, not really, but... Um it's also uh, quite interesting, and it's related. But, but uh, no, it's more like uh, you know the literal belief in the Bible that that oh, every word in the Bible is the word of God. Ah, but half a minute. Nobody takes the Bible literally. Someone do. Someone oh does. no, they don't. I've never met a person. Let me test that out. Jesus said, "I am the door." <laughs> what? What is are those? He a door? Of course not. It's a metaphor. Now, this is a very important question. The word literal is a most misleading thing. And any literature is full of metaphor. For example, the very first page of the Bible, and God said, let there be light. What does that mean? Said? But God is spirit. He's not got a voice box and lungs like I've got. So the word said, when talked about God, doesn't mean the same as when talked about me. But I know that said means communication. So I can say, well, it's God communicating. How he did it, I don't know. So there's metaphor in the very first page. There's metaphor everywhere in all literature. Sometimes when people ask me this question, I say, Israel was a land flowing with milk and honey. So that when the Israelites came into the land, they saw a great big sticky ball of milk and honey coming, powering down the main street. Well, of course not. It's a metaphor. Israel was a land, that's literal. Milk and honey, they were literal. The metaphor is flowing. Now, here's the point. I've learned a lot from C.S. Lewis about this, about ordinary grammar. You see, the problem with many people is they think they're treating the Bible as more than a book, and they end up treating it as less than a book. When Jesus said, I am the door, he didn't mean he was a literal door. He meant he was a real door. Now here, think hard. This is very important in your understanding of language. You see, we often make the mistake that because there's a metaphor it's not real, but that's not true. Metaphors almost always stand for something real. Suppose your friend comes into class tomorrow and you see that she's been weeping and you say, what's wrong? She says, my heart is broken. And you go and get a surgeon. Of course not. It's a metaphor. The pump isn't broken. 
you know that she means she's got a very real experience. So when Jesus said, I am the door, he's not a literal door like that. He's a real doorway into an experience of God. The word literal is a problem. It's almost a useless word. Because what's literal at one level, what's not literal at one level can be literal at the next level. Jesus is not a literal door at the base level. He's a literal doorway into an experience of God at the next level. And it's the word literal that's misleading people. So when people say they take the Bible literally, they don't actually know what they're talking about. I'm I'm sorry. They just don't understand anything about their own language. And I think this can be cleared up relatively easily because people are afraid because they think that metaphor means it's not real. Now, the interesting thing is we know that Jesus did not mean he was a literal door because we know about literal doors. We know something about the real world. We know something about science in general, you see. So that's the first point I'd want to make. I take the Bible seriously as a book. I'm not prepared to treat it as less than a book and apply uh, attitudes to it that you'd never dream of applying even to the newspaper or to what your friends say. Does that make sense? I think so, yes. But, but I also think that the, the person who uh, asked this question also thought about the, the problem about uh, the, the book as canon or as a, as a oh, de- yes, definite yes. Uh, you know, revelation because there are other scriptures that uh, oh, yes, didn't get right. into the Bible and the maybe someone else... And things like that, yes, Exactly, of and maybe someone uh, thinks that the, uh, the Apocalypse of John uh, maybe should be left out and, oh, sure. and all that. But now you're opening up a, a, a huge... Mm academic subject that's very important but you know when you read these things and I've read them all I mean even from my own personal view you can see why the church over the centuries didn't regard them as as canonical because they don't bear the same authority some of them are full of crazy stories and all all sorts of things like that I, I my own view is that God supervised the process and that what we've got is authoritative scripture. But my conviction about it is not, you see this, let me, let me backtrack. This was a problem for me at Cambridge. I met many people who said the Bible is the word of God, but they never read it. Uh, I would test them on this, you see. I would say to them, do you believe Ezekiel is the word of God? Oh yes, what is it about? What? They had no idea. So their belief in inspiration was purely technical. It wasn't real. I wanted mine to be real. So I started off the other way around. Let's actually study this stuff. And let's not worry about what category we place it in. Does it make sense? Does it cohere to reality? Does it work out in life? That's the real kind of conviction and inspiration of Scripture. This is the only conviction that I think is worthwhile. The, the technical idea, I believe it's all the word of God, when you don't even know what's in it, is not impressive. <coughs> Thank you. We have one or two last questions. We That's a mercy. Yes, very good. Mm-hmm. How old are you? Uh, excuse me, how old <laughs> is the universe? Oh, it's a bit older than me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how old is the universe? Wow, you see. My, well, you know, the current estimate by the cosmologists is... And to save time, uh, together with that question, how old is the universe, how did it come into being? Oh, right, okay. And it's not how did you come into being. No, 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 they know how I came into being. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Right, how old is the universe, how how did it come into being? Three minutes. (laughs) Well, that's impossible. But let me just say this. Firstly, um, I think the current estimate of the age of the universe is 13.75 or 13.8 billion years. I see no difficulty with that as a scientist and as a Christian. And I know what's behind this question, of course, because I've heard it thousands of times. Um, I've written a book about it, actually, if you're interested, called Seven Days That Divide the Earth. And here's a very good example. Oh, it's there. He's got it. Mm -hmm. This is a very good example of where taking the Bible seriously solves the problem immediately. Let me tell you how it works. 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When was that? Well, in the Genesis text, it's followed by a sequence of days. And people say, well, we can work out the days and so on and so forth. Okay. But they make the assumption that the beginning is on day one. It isn't. Not in the text. The sequence of days, each day begins with, and God said. The Bible begins with, in the beginning. And Hebrew, if you study Hebrew, and I'm not an expert, that's why I consult the experts, they point out that the first two verses of Genesis 1 are in a different past tense from the sequence of days. What does that mean? Well, they tell me it means simply this, that the introduction in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is detached from the sequence of days. They occur afterwards. How long afterwards? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I don't think the Bible says anything about A, the age of the universe, or the age of the earth. Even though it was a famous archbishop from my home city that caused a lot of the problem in the first place. So that's point number one. Taking the Bible seriously resolves a problem that worries many Christians. Now I have a lot more to say about it, and that's why I wrote this book. Two, um, how did it happen? Well, in one sense I can answer that question, in another sense I can't. It depends on what way you ask the question. In the beginning God created it. That is, God caused it to exist. Now, contemporary cosmologists think that we get the universe from nothing. That is nothing physical. They're having a lot of difficulty with that because getting something from nothing is very hard work. And I haven't time to go into that. I've written another book that touches on it. But getting something from nothing has proved to be so difficult that the cosmologists have redefined nothing. There's, I give lectures on nothing these days. It's one of the most interesting topics you could ever meet. And when I find leading cosmologists, just let me try this in you. What would you think of this if you read it in a book? And it's in a book. Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. What? That's sheer nonsense. And yet it's written by one of the world's leading astrophysicists, Lawrence Christ. They cannot get a universe from nothing, though they try to. So they have to redefine nothing and make it something. But nothing isn't something. Now, I could argue that for ages. What I think the answer is, in one way the answer is, the universe didn't come from nothing. It came from God. But God is not material. He's not physical. God is spirit. The atheists have no answer and they're struggling terribly. Because once you see people having to write complete nonsense, you know that something's wrong. So um, Stephen Hawking does the same thing. Let me tell you what he says. Because there is a law of gravity. We started here. We might as well finish here. Because there is a law of gravity... The universe can and will create itself from nothing. When I first read that, I thought, what? Because there is a law of gravity, because there's something, the universe will create itself from nothing. Flat contradiction. Because there's something, it creates itself from nothing. But it's worse than that. The universe will create itself. If I say to you, X creates Y, what does that mean? Roughly, if you've got X, you'll get Y, yes? If I say X creates X, what does that mean? If you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense is still nonsense, even if scientists write it. So that's all I'm going to say about nothing. I thank you for making sense of nothing. Well, I... Thank you very much for those questions. Those are a very good set of questions. And uh, from most of the schools I've been in, they're pretty well the best set of questions I've had. So congratulations to you and congratulations to the teachers. They're obviously teaching you something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.